Okay, hey everyone, this is lesson number two. We're continuing along with parabolas. What you should have got out of the last one is basically every quadratic equation is going to turn into a parabola. However, they're not actually very useful for drawing from the quadratic equation. So we're going to look at a more useful form, which is going to make it a lot easier. So I'm just going to jump out of here real quick. I'm going to share my screen. And hopefully now you can see that we've got Desmos open. I'm going to hide this one here, and you can just have a quick look. This is the general form for a quadratic uh, equation or a function. And we can change A and B and do all that stuff. Um, these aren't super helpful when you want to graph it. So we're going to look at another equation here, which looks like this guy. This is what's known as the vertex form, and this is going to be a lot more useful for graphing. The reason why this is so useful, when it's in this form, we can actually very easily predict what's going to happen to the, uh, the parabola. Its vertex is going to move around according to the values for P, Q, and A, and it's really, really, really uh, straightforward and predictable. So first of all, I'm just going to go here. Uh, you'll notice I typed it in as A, X minus B squared plus Q. Um, P, Q are sliders, and A is still all the way up here, and I'm going to talk about A in just a sec, but I just want to focus on P and Q. So if I take P and I move it to the right, take a second, just think about it, maybe even pause the video, what's the probably going to do? You might already know, but you might not. So here it is moving to the right. As P gets bigger, the parabola moves over to the right. As P gets smaller, the parabola moves to the left. So as I'm dragging my slider around, I can see what's happening to P. It moves the vertex and the entire parabola left and right. What's Q going to do? Well, if Q gets big, it goes up. If Q gets small, it goes down. One thing that I'm going to mention here is this has to be X minus P. If it's X plus P, everything's going to get reversed. Now there's also this A out in front. What does the A do? Well, if we go back up here, we can actually change the slider for A. We can move it back and forth. This A in front here is the same as this A in front here. B and C and P and Q are not really related in an obvious way, although they are related in a vague way. <clears throat> we'll talk about that later. But A is the same. So if I actually push the uh, play button here on A, we can actually see that both parabolas are going to move around the same way. If I push B, it's going to do this. And if I push P, it's going to do this. So they're not really related. And if I push C, this is going to happen. And Q, that's going to happen. Q and C are related, but they're not exactly the same thing. Okay, well anyway, that's the introduction. We're going to get to the notes in just a sec. So I'm going to turn this on, and I'm going to start from the beginning here. So this is section 4.4, Analyzing Quadratic Functions in Vertex Form. Let's get rolling. So, vertex form of a quadratic function. I said function, I didn't put function notation here. If you really are upset about that, you could write f of x, but it doesn't really matter that much. So what we have is we have y equals a x minus p in brackets squared plus q. The whole point of this is the vertex coordinates are given by p comma q. If I jump out of this and I go back to Desmos just for a sec, let me get rid of this red one because that's not interesting today. But I'm going to just stop this. I'm going to stop this. If I actually set my value for p and q at something, so I'm going to set my value for p at something like 3, and I'm going to set my value for q for 2, you can see what happens to the vertex is it moves exactly to the point 3, 2. And if p gets bigger, like p goes to 4, then the vertex moves over to an x-coordinate of 4. So it's a very simple, straightforward <clears throat> relationship between P and Q. What we say is the entire parabola gets translated, which is a fancy way of saying moved, up Q units and right P units. So another way of looking at this is from a transformations point of view, more of in grade 12 on that. But for now, you can think about we started with Y equals X squared. And when we put in these factors like P and Q, we subtract something from X and it moves it left and right. 
And if you add something over here, it moves it up and down. That's a general thing with all functions, but we're mostly talking about parabolas right now, so I'm not going to expand on that too much. It's a little bit of a pun there for you. A is a vertical expansion. This actually looks like a horizontal compression. To see what I mean, let's just jump out of this and go to Desmos one more time. So if I actually take A, and I'm going to, I'll just leave A there, I guess. If I take A and I want to mess around with it, I can see what happens to my parabola. If A is 1, which is like if there's nothing out in front, my parabola looks like a pretty standard run-of-the-mill parabola. If I make A equal to 2, you can actually see it looks like it's getting skinnier and skinnier and skinnier. That's not really what's happening. It's actually getting taller, but a tall parabola is going to actually look skinnier. So it basically looks like a horizontal compression or squeezing. If I make A small, it actually gets really short, which looks like it's getting wide. If A is 0, it becomes a flat line. You'll notice at some point we were saying A could never be equal to 0, and well, this is why. It's, it's not a parabola, it's not quadratic anymore. If A is negative, it flips over, so it's pointing downward. We said that in the lesson last time, that when A is less than 0, it's a uh, downward opening parabola. And when A gets really negative, it's still downward, but it gets very skinny or tall, depending on how you want to look at it. Okay. I'm going to switch windows here. So A is the vertical expansion. As A increases, the parabola gets narrower or taller, depending on how you want to look at it. And as uh, if A is bigger than 0, the parabola opens up, which was mentioned before. If A is less than 0, the parabola opens down. And of course, A can never, ever be equal to 0 because then it's just a line. Okay, uh, here's another pun, expanding on A. When you're drawing non-expanded parabolas like y equals x squared, it's best to start by drawing the vertex and plot the adjacent points according to the following pattern. So what the pattern is here is it's going to be, uh, well, I'm going to show you in just a sec, but I actually just want to do this first. X, y. When x is 0, y is 0. When x is 1, y is 1. When x is 2, y is 4. When x is 3, y is 9, and so on. <clears throat> so when we're drawing that, we're going to put a point here at the vertex, and then we're going to go, you're always moving 1 to the right for your values of x. But how much you move up by is different, and we can think of it in terms of first differences here, is we think we, we start at y is equal to 1, we go 1 to the right, and then we're going to go up by 1. So we go over 1, up by 1, and we plot our next point at 1, 1. You could say my next point is 3 higher than that. So I go over 1, and then I go up 1, 2, 3, and I plot a point there. But I actually kind of like to always go back to the vertex. So the way I tend to think about it is I tend to think you start at the vertex, you go over 1, then up 1. You go back to the vertex, you go over 2, then up 4. You go back to the vertex, you go over 3, then up 9. How far up you go is always the square of how far to the right you went, or the left, because it doesn't matter. Because if you go negative 1 to the left, you square to go up 1. So that's what it means when you say y equals x squared. If I move over 1, I go up 1 squared. If I move over 2, I go up 2 squared, which is 4, and so on. So the pattern I would say is we go over 1, up 1 over 2, up 4, over 3, up 9, over 4, up 16, and so on. That's how a normal parabola would get drawn. And I could actually connect these points together, and if I do this without totally screwing this up, which I sort of have, if I do this properly, and I draw a nice curve, then what I'm going to get is I'm going to get a nice parabola like that. And it's going to look like a proper parabola. Please draw your parabolas relatively uh, accurately. Okay, so what A does is if A is 2, then the vertical changes are doubled and the pattern becomes, it's not over 1 up 1, it becomes over 1 up 2. And instead of over 2 up 4, it becomes over 2 up 8. Instead of going up 3, it goes up 18. So we double all the vertical changes. You never mess with the horizontal changes because x is independent, but y gets doubled. And this uh, can be for anything. If a was 3, you would triple those. It would be over 1, up 3, over 2, up 
12, over 3, up 27. I have to think about that a little bit. So a, an expanded parabola is then going to look like if A is equal to 2, you'll still start at the vertex. You go over 1, up 2, over 2, up 4, but it will go over, we'll go up 8 this time. Instead of going up 9, we'll go up 16, which is way off my graph. And you can see what happens. Your parabola actually gets taller. In getting taller, it appears narrower. So just keep in mind, you, you are actually vertically expanding your points, but that has the appearance of making it horizontally compressed. So y equals 2x squared is in the blue, and the red is equal to y equals 1x squared, which is y equals x squared. Okay, so that's how I would recommend drawing your problems. Okay, so for the quadratic function, blah, 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 you guys can see that. Graph it. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to look at this. I'm going to say p equals whatever, q equals whatever, a equals whatever. Okay, so a is obvious, it's negative 2. q is obvious, it's equal to 3. Sometimes people get screwed up with p, because remember, the general form of this is x minus p squared plus 3. So if it's x minus p and you have x plus 1, that's kind of like saying x minus negative 1. So p is actually negative 1, not positive. It's always the opposite of s sine 1. So if we have to graph this, we're going to find our vertex. The vertex is located at p comma q. That's the whole point of vertex form. So what we're going to do is it's going to be at 1 comma 3. Sorry, negative 1 comma 3. So we're going to go negative 1 comma 3. We're going to find our vertex right there. Now we've got this guy here, which says a equals negative 2. So if a equals negative 2, then the pattern for drawing this becomes, it used to be uh, over 1, up 1, over 2, up 4, over 3, up 9, and so on. But what are these values going to become? The vertical expansion coefficient, which is a, means this is not up 1. We're going to multiply that by negative 2. So this actually becomes down 2. And instead of up 4, this is going to get multiplied by negative 2. So it becomes down 8. And this one becomes down 18. So the way that I'm going to now draw my parabola here is I'm going to start at the vertex. I'm going to follow my pattern. I'm going to go over 1, down 2. So starting here, over 1, down 2. I go back to the vertex. I go over 1, down 8. So let's see, where's 4? There it is, 8. And then over 3, down 18. I'm going to be off my graph. And I go do the same thing on the left because parabolas are symmetric. So over 1, down 2 here. Over 2, down 8 here. So now I have enough that I can at least kind of sketch the graph. Always put arrows on the ends. Okay? State the domain range and axis of symmetry. So for part B, the domain, x is all real numbers, easy peasy. Range, y is less than or equal to 3. We can see the highest point is right here. That's the maximum. y equals 3. So why is everything less than or equal to 3? And then finally, the axis of symmetry is a vertical line cutting down the middle. And that will be x equals, oops, x equals negative 1. OK. Solve for the intercepts exactly. If we just jump back for a second, you can see the intercepts are kind of there and there, but we'd like to know where they are exactly. How do we do this? Set y equals 0 for x intercepts. So this becomes 0 equals negative 2, x plus 1 squared plus 3. Some people are going to go nuts and expand this whole thing out. I'll show you the easiest way of doing this. Take the 3 to the other side. Then divide by negative 2, so the negatives will cancel. And then square root both sides. So you're going to generate plus and minus root 3 over 2 equals x plus 1. And then finally, we can say x equals, we'll move the 1 to the other side. 
Okay, there's our two roots. That's not a very uh, pleasant number, but we can say that x equals negative 1 plus uh, root 3 over 2, or if we want to rationalize it, it would be 2 root, oops, it would be root 6 over 2. Remember, rationalizing is you multiply top and bottom by root 2 to get rid of the radical on the bottom. Uh, so that would be one of them. The other one would be this. Okay, those would be our two x-intercepts. When we say exactly, we're looking for the roots, not a decimal approximation. Now, this number doesn't make a whole heck of a lot of sense, so if you want to estimate it, the square root of 6 is about, I don't know, let's say 2.5. So negative 1 plus 2.5 over 2. Uh, what's that? Negative 1 plus something, something a little bigger than 1. If I had to estimate, I don't have my calculator handy, I'm going to estimate it's probably at about 0 0.3. This one's negative 1 minus something a little bigger than 1, so this is probably like negative 2.3 or something like that. Does that actually look right? Um, that's about negative 2.3 and that's about positive 0.3, so that's actually pretty good. Um, I actually don't need to solve for my y-intercept, but I'm going to just do it. So we're going to set x equals 0 to solve the y-intercept. Can you get the y-intercept by just looking at the equation? Take a second, think about that. Pause the video if you need. Okay, you might have your answer. The answer is, let's find out. Is there anything about that equation that just instantly tells me what the y-intercept would be? Could we have determined that the y-intercept was a value of 1? We could see on the graph that it is. But just looking at this, you might say, well, there's a 1 right there. That's not the same thing. That's actually a total coincidence. There's nothing about this vertex form that tells you what the y-intercept is. In the general form, you can totally do it. But here, you can't. You have to work it out. I say, okay, like I'm expecting a response. No, I'm just talking to myself. All right, here's one more. You can try this yourself. Uh, I would definitely pause the video and try it before you move on. Um, I'll give you a sec to actually do that. Okay, so for all the people who are diligent workers, good for you. For all those people who are lazy. Okay, so where's our vertex? So the vertex is located at, see this, P equals 3. It's X minus 3, so P is positive 3. This one, q, is equal to negative 2. This one, a, is equal to a half. And I don't like decimals, so I'm going to do a fraction. So the vertex is located at 3, comma, negative 2. So we're going to go 1, 2, 3, 1, 2. There's a vertex. And if I want to do a, so this is going to be interesting. Normally we'd go over 1, up 1, but this is going to be up a half. We're going to multiply by a half. Over 1, up Oh, shoot, over 2, up 4. We're going to multiply 4 by half, so you're really only going up 2. And then over 3, up 9. Nope. You're going to go up 4.5, or 4 and a half. So starting here, we're going to go over 1, up a half. So there we go, and we can do it on the left and the right. Here we can go over 2, up 2. So we're actually going to go there, 2 to the left, we're going to go there. And then 3, we're going to go up 4.5. So we're going to go right about there. Three to the left, and we're going to go right about there. Connect them all up, draw some arrows. You could get more points, but I think three's, three on either side is probably pretty good. <clears throat> Label all the intercepts. You can see we have a y-intercept right here. This one's actually uh, simple. This is at 2.5. Uh, this one I can see we actually crossed exactly at those points, so the x-intercepts are right there. Uh, I should probably put this in the proper coordinate notation. So this will be 0, 2.5. This will be 1, 0. And this one will be, uh, what's that? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 0. OK. Domain range. Domain. X is all real numbers. Again, simple. Range. Y is bigger than or equal to negative 2. That's the lowest point there at negative 2. And then, uh, I didn't say it, but let's just do it anyway. Axis of symmetry, x equals 3. Okay, determining the equation of a parabola. So now I'm giving you a graph. You have to work backwards to get the equation. 
This is not really a super hard thing, but I'll show you the process. Uh, we start with the general uh, structure of the vertex form. Can I determine from this graph where P and Q are? There it is. Okay, so this is at negative two comma negative three. So what I can write so far, I don't know what A is, but I can write x minus negative two squared plus negative three. Okay, there's my P and Q. That's ugly. I'm going to clean it up. So this becomes x plus two squared minus three. If you want to get A, you need another piece of information. Fortunately, I've given it to you. You cannot do this without knowing at least one other piece of information. This here is going to help you. So if we sub it in for x and y, we can actually get rid of, whoops, we can get rid of some of our variables. Here, I don't know y, a, or x. So I need to get rid of two of them, and that's exactly what that point can do for me. So I'm going to substitute in 5 for y, 0 for x, and I'm now going to solve this equation for only one variable. So I'm going to move 3 to the other side by adding it. I'm going to square 2. Then I'm going to divide. And I can figure out a is equal to 2. Once I know this, I can now take this and I can put it back. Whoopsie. I can put it back into this guy right. Whoop, I went too far. I can put it right back into this guy here. And I can say y equals 2 x plus 2 squared minus 3. We have to leave x and y as variables, even though we substituted in, we've got to go back to leaving them as variables, because that's how you make a graph, right? x can vary, and so can y. That's going to be my equation that's going to give me this uh, nice little parabola. One other thing you could have done if you were paying close attention, you could have used the pattern. So one way that you can use the pattern is you can start it at the vertex, and you can say, well, I know this point is right here. To get to that point, I have to go over 2, and how far up do I have to go? I was at negative 3, and I had to go up to 5. So I had to go over 2, up 8. Well, normally when you go over 2, you go up 4, because you square it. But if you're going up twice as far as normal, well, A had to be 2, because you're doubling all your vertical uh, increases. So sometimes you can even do this by looking at it and not doing a lick of algebra. All right, last one. This one's a little trickier here. Give this a try. I'll just show you how you can do it here. So now I've told you a little less information. It passes through a couple points, and it has an axis of symmetry right here. One thing you might have noticed is P equals this. So if you sketch this parabola, and it has an axis of symmetry right here at x is equal to negative 1, somewhere, that parabola is somewhere there. The vertex is always on the axis of symmetry. I don't know if it's up or down. I don't know anything about the parabola, but I can guarantee P is negative 1. So what this allows me to do is I can say, therefore, y equals a x minus P. So minus negative is positive. I don't know a or q. If you don't know two variables, you need two equations. And fortunately, two pieces of information can generate two equations. So this is a bit of a trickier question, but I wanted to show you one that was a little more complicated. So I'm going to substitute in this first. So the point 1, 2, y is 2, x is 1. And I can do that. It didn't get me anywhere other than getting rid of x and y. I still have A and I still have Q. So I need to sub in another one. So this is going to become negative 4 equals A, and then X is 3. So now I've got two equations and two unknowns, which is called a system of equations. If you remember from Math 10, you learned how to solve this. There's a couple ways you can do it. The easiest way uh, is well, I don't know if it's easiest, but the most uh, used way is substitution. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually take this. I'm going to rewrite it. 2 equals, let's see, 1 plus 1 equals 2 squared, which is 4. So 4a plus q. I'm going to rewrite this one. Negative 4 equals, let's see, 3 plus 1 squared is 4. 16, 16a plus q. 
The one method that a lot of people like is they like substitution. The other method is where you uh, add the equations together. Substitution, I think it's both right. Um, which is the elimination method. I'm going to use substitution here. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to take a different color. I'm going to rewrite this. So this guy here, I don't want this to get too darn messy. In fact, I'll, I'm going to erase substitution. Because this one I'm going to rewrite as q equals 2, and I'm going to take 4a to the other side. So 2 minus 4a. Now I'm going to take that and I'm going to substitute it in there. So this becomes negative 4 equals 16a plus q. But instead of q, I'm going to write 2 minus 4a. So this becomes negative 4 equals 16a plus 2 minus 4a. And I'm going to collect like terms. So that's going to become 12a. I'll take that 2 to the other side, negative 6. And I can see that if I divide the 2, negative 6 over 12, or negative 1 half. Okay, so I have to do all that work to get a. Now I've got to figure out q, but the good news is once I know a, q is really easy, because guess what? See this equation over here? Once you know a, you can stick it back in. So this value of a, we can actually put it, put it back in to find q. All right, so then this thing's going to become, if a is equal to negative 1 half, this is going to become q equals 2 minus 4 times negative 1 half. So that's 2, uh, 4 and a half is 2, 2 plus 2, 2 plus 2 is 4. There you go. Okay, so therefore, we would say y equals, now we've got a. We already had uh, p, so x plus 1 squared, and q is plus 4. That should be the final equation. So I'm a little nervous that I might have made a mistake, so I'm just going to take a second, go to Desmos, and see if this actually does everything we need. Good news is you're at home, so you can Desmos all the time. Okay, so I'm just going to try and remember that. Let's erase here. Let's get rid of this and this and this. Okay, so y equals, uh, what did I have? Negative 1 over 2. We had x plus 1, and we had plus 4. If I put all this in, let's see if it actually does what? It's supposed to. So it's supposed to pass through 1, 2, and 3, negative 4. So let's just actually plot this. 1, 2, and 3, negative 4. Label it. Okay. So the axis of symmetry, I can even make a line x equals negative 1. There's my axis of symmetry. There's my point 1, 2, and there's my point 3, negative 4. So it does. This was supposed to be, what did I, what did I do? Oh, never mind, that was good. Sorry, I'm, I'm getting freaked out with my axes. Okay, never mind. So anyway, this all worked out. Life is good. Okay, thanks for watching. Uh, do your homework, kids. Goodbye.